Support provided by the Richard P. Garmany Fund at the Hartford Foundation for Public Giving, the State of Connecticut Office of Film, Television, and Digital Media, and Connecticut Humanities. For all my life, I've loved art. From my time as a musician and artist, I believe the stories of artists themselves can inform, excite, and elevate. I mean, I think for the most part, everyone does have some type of spiritual journey. Um, and I think it looks different for everyone. Mm -hmm. I've learned over the years that making art is that for me. Artists can inform us of history, of a moment in time, and reflect on modern society. And I find this fascinating. That's why I'm on the search for Connecticut's most vibrant artists and to shed light on their stories, from designers and painters to muralists and poets. Join me as I find the people that make up Connecticut's art scene on Where Art Thou? Welcome to Where Art Thou? I'm your host, Ray Hardman. Today, we are in Hartford. Now, you can't spell Hartford without using the word art, and it seems like no matter where we go, right around the corner, art is right in front of us here in the capital city. I'm on my way to the CAF on Trumbull Street to meet our curator for this episode. Now, the CAF, from what I understand, is this really cool, funky boutique that features uh, some items from local artists and designers. Our curator, the person that's going to show us around today, his name is Joshua Jenkins. He's the co-owner of arts and events organizer Breakfast, Lunch, and Dinner, which owns and operates the CAF. He's also a visual artist. Let's go see what Joshua has for us today. Joshua. Right. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you too. Yeah, this is the CAF. Tell me about this place. So the CAF is an emerging uh, multi-brand boutique based in Hartford. Yeah, I mean, we're just trying to give a contemporary vantage point of everything related to fashion, music, art, and culture for the city of Hartford. I mean, I can just first glance, I know this is not your regular boutique and these clothes you're not gonna find on Nordstrom Rack. 100%. You know, about half of the store features emerging designers from all around CT, Hartford, Bridgeport, New Haven. You know, basically items that we believe are, are just not usually accessible in this region. My background has always sort of been just connecting the dots. I've always felt more keen to celebrating the ideas of others you know, we like to use the tagline, um, we're here to serve our creative community. Yeah. And, um, you know, I was, uh, you know, talking with a friend recently about the fact that Hartford um, tends to lack third spaces. And I think, you know, in a lot of ways, we were hoping to use this space as basically uh, an area to, to serve congregation amongst um, the like-minded. And so, you know, focusing on the creative community in Hartford different emerging designers, artists, musicians, um, you know, this is the place that you can come and, you know, feel like you're, you're, um, you're at home. You know, we recognize that it's kind of our job to design the type of city that we want to, you know, live in. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'm excited about it. I lived in Hartford for many years, so mm -hmm. I'm just excited to see things happening downtown. So tell me about some of the places we're going today rapper, artist, uh, Don McLennan. He had an opportunity to sort of take his, um, his music career on a sort of international level. Um, he was formerly a part of the, uh, the rap group Rock Hampton that has gone on to perform at festivals, have traveled all around the world. Most people in his position, you know, they're gonna stay in like a New York or uh, in LA. Dom saw an opportunity to take everything he's learned and take some of the resources he's been able to 
uh, gather to bring that back to, to Hartford. Who else are we seeing? Uh, Linda Luz, um, who is um, a Hartford-based artist. She has background in uh, you know, street art, graffiti, um, but has, has since then transcended to um, a lot of multimedia. She really has like sort of came into her own in terms of uh, her aesthetic and, and her uh, formula as an artist. Well, Joshua, thank you so much. I'm gonna go check out these artists you've suggested mm -hmm. and thank you for this introduction to the calf. I definitely wanna come back again. Absolutely, we have you know plenty of events and pop-ups and uh, it would be great to, to have you, you know, come hang out with us sometime. I'd love it, yeah, I'd love it, sure. thank you. So nice, to meet, nice to meet you. Nice to meet you too. This is absolutely beautiful. Thank you, appreciate it. Tell me about the mural. Yeah, definitely. So this mural is a collaboration with Sina. We have been working on a series of murals called Hartford Heroes. And this year we wanted to celebrate Nuestra Historia, which is our history, our story. So we, I ended up creating this concept where I wanted to have hands interlocking and have each hand represent just a different identity and culture and kind of having this infinite um, loop going. And then you have these butterflies, a monarch butterflies that um, normally they migrate right from Mexico um, to the United States and vice versa. I know muralists all do it different, but how did you deal with the scale? Yeah, so I have been playing around with different um, techniques lately. I, I was fortunate enough to project this onto the wall, so it was very tedious, especially given that there's a lot of traffic in this area, so I had to come over like 2 o'clock in the morning just to try to get the best angles um, and also less traffic flow, so I was able to do that um, with a friend, and then I then went in and started painting throughout the day. I know that you're known for murals, but you have started to move in a different direction. Yes, yes, yes. Can we go to your studio yeah. and have a peek at what you're working on? Yeah, definitely, for sure. Let's just go back to the beginning. I mean, were you one of those children that was just inherently creative? Were you an artist at, at a young age? Yeah, I, I guess I would say so. I definitely have been surrounded by art at a really young age. Um, it's funny because I was just talking to a friend about this not too long ago. Um, I remember even in school, like the teachers would always notice that I was like more interested in drawing. So they would kind of put me aside and they're like, just go at it, you know? Mm -hmm. So I would spend hours just drawing and playing and you know, figuring out like what what I want, what world I want to create um, visually. So I did spend a lot of time mm -hmm. as a kid. You were a drawer back then. I was a drawer. I was a painter. Like I remember preschool, walking into my preschool class and I saw an easel, and the first thing I wanted to do was paint. Like that was like instant for me. Um, and then now, um, 15. When I was 15, I was like really more dedicated and serious about um, taking on art as a career. My father, Victor Carrillo, 
He used to be a boxer in Peru, really well known. You know, they came to the United States, to New York, to live that dream, you know, the American dream, immigrant dream. Alongside with my mom, like they, he saw like my passion and interest for art and really encouraged me to continue doing that. I even think there's times where he would mention that um, he wished he was an artist. Like that was something that he gravitated towards at a really young age, but unfortunately didn't have the right mentorship to do that. So boxing was his thing, you know? In your artwork, in your murals, and in your regular artwork, what is, what is your hope for the, the person that sees it? That's a good question. Um, for me, I think a lot of the times it's more of like people being able to see themselves. I do, a lot of the murals that I have done throughout the years are very intentional with not just the people that are collaborating with the mural, like community, whether it's elders or like youth, but it's also just kind of the space. Diving into my roots, I've been like studying my culture a little bit more and like getting familiar with like um, just practices that were done um, through, through Peruvian culture. And yeah, I'm noticing that's kind of been a, a huge like impact and hopefully that can help me better define exactly what it is that I'm trying to create here. I mean, I think for the most part, everyone does have some type of spiritual journey. Um, and I think it looks different for everyone. Mm -hmm. I've learned over the years that making art is that for me. Um, and sometimes music or just playing around with sound. Um, and, you know, sacred spaces are meant for people to feel safe. Um, not just you as in the person creating that sacred space, but mm -hmm. also the people that you're inviting in. Um, so I always think about that often, more so now, and there's times where I even like practice rituals with myself, and rituals, you know, they can mean so many different things, like as of recent I have been doing a lot of like meditative practice and breath work that mm -hmm. kind of creates, a, a sets a tone for a space to be sacred and feel more connected, mm -hmm. yeah. I actually went to University of Harvard graphic design. Mm -hmm. um, I realized at an early age I needed to find something that was more substantial as an artist. Um, painting wasn't something I love, but I realized easily like you can't really make you know money or survive off of that. Um, so I did graphic design and got to learn technology, you know, and, and really dove into that. I really enjoyed like um, learning about just how the structure of that works. So. It's interesting because you, you've got this background in computer graphic design, but so much of your art seems very free and, and liberating. Yep. Do, do you notice that? Yeah, of course. I mean, and that's, that's the whole thing, right? Like going to high school and like really being experimental, but then going to UHART and getting more structure and developing like some type of like um, really fine fine lines I guess digitally really and then merging them together has really allowed me to play between like um, limitations and also not having limitations mm -hmm. just like an abundance of variation of things right that so sense. finding that creativity within yeah. the boundaries of, of a, a computer program yeah yeah, yeah. Like, I'll spend hours sketching on paper sometimes and then I'll develop a digital version of what those pieces are. So this ended up being, I, I changed oh, it completely. Isn't that beautiful. Um, thank you. But essentially, this is like an image of like an inner child reaching up, and then this is like a form of like the person resisting, but then you have this ancestor behind you kind of like guiding you through. Oh, yeah. So I, I've, you know, and then this is like another sketch. So it's just, I go back and forth from paper, drawing on paper to drawing digitally to sometimes going straight to the canvas. Mm -hmm. I feel like I've been in Hartford for so long where I can really try to capture an essence in a sense um, and, and honor that's like a constant theme. So I think, um, yeah, finding that togetherness and hopefully people start to see that. Well, Linda Luce, thank you so much for inviting us into your studio, seeing all your beautiful art and, and sharing your story with us. Thank you, I appreciate you being here and you know sharing these beautiful conversations. So. You can't talk about Hartford's art scene without mentioning the Wadsworth Athenaeum Museum of Art located right downtown. 
art surrounds you every place you turn there. And while each room offers a different experience, I got a chance to catch up with the museum's conservator and a behind-the-scenes look at the process he takes to preserve these priceless pieces of art. Wow. Alan. Hey, Ray. Nice to meet you. My pleasure meeting you. This is incredible. Tell me about this space. It truly is. This is the uh, conservation studio of the museum. Um, and what we do here is all of the uh, conservation work, which, which entails the study, the preservation, and restoration of objects in the collection. Alan, I know this is a painting that you are intimately familiar with. Tell me a little bit about it. Uh, this is a wonderful painting, uh, one of my favorite in the collection here at the Wadsworth. Um, it's by an artist named Francisco Ribalta. Um, it was executed in about 1625 uh, for a Franciscan monastery. Um, and what the painting is showing us, the scene is, is actually a really interesting point in the narrative of St. Francis's life. Um, this is before, uh, he's not on his deathbed quite, quite yet, um, but he, he is very ill at this moment in time. Um, he's in his chamber, um, which, which is not very lavishly set out. You can see it's, uh, it, it's a very uh, humble uh, environment. And just at this moment, St. Francis has this vision of this angel that bursts into the room, uh, riding a cloud, playing beautiful music, and, and he is so enthralled and in ecstasy. And, and the title of the painting is The Ecstasy of St. Francis. It only makes sense that there would be, um, you know, some kind of disrepair on a painting that is hundreds and hundreds of years old, no matter how well you take care of it. What's some of the simple, or what are some of the basic issues you have to deal with with a, with a painting that's been taken care of relatively? Um, what kind of issues do you deal with to get it back to what it was like? Uh, well, one, one of the unfortunate truths of, of conservation is much of the work that we are doing on paintings today um, that have been around for hundreds of years is really undoing or, or fixing issues that arose when individuals in the past tried to fix a painting. Um, today we have the luxury of environmental controls and museums and the ability to really care for a painting. Um, this is an image here during that cleaning process. So okay, here. so you're taking off some of the old restoration and... First and foremost, it's the varnish layer that's over the surface. Um, but it gives you a real sense of how that process is kind of carried out. So this is the teardown. This is the teardown. This, this gets us back to, um, again, there is some restoration there, so it's not necessarily the, the, uh, what's left of the original painting, um, but, but it really is the point that we started with, with the, the, the mm -hmm. real restoration process, which is uh, putting, putting uh, color back onto the surface to complete the image. Oh, wow. Let's talk about the x-ray. Tell me what, what x-rays tell you as a conservator. X-rays, well, and when we're x-raying a painting, uh, believe it or not, it's very much like x-raying uh, a body part. Uh, areas of, of either physically thinner paint or molecularly uh, lighter weight paint um, is going to appear dark. Um, but on here too, we can also see, well one, we're seeing the, the wooden stretcher behind the, the canvas. Oh, sure, sure, yeah. Um, and then um, we'll see all these dark spots in the, in the painting itself. These are areas of flake loss where, where again, as, as the canvas kind of expands and contracts, mm -hmm. um, the, the ground layer, the paint layer, the, the gesso that's holding onto the surface of the canvas flake away. Tell me why this is, this is all so important. I mean, obviously to make the painting look good, but tell, tell me more. Well, the preservation of, of the artwork is really our, our utmost uh, responsibility here at the Wadsworth. Um, any, any, you know, we tend to talk about these paintings as the other art paintings, right? The Wadsworth, we own this painting, uh, but of course we don't. This, is, this painting belongs to the world. And so um, we are merely the caretakers at this point in time. So, um, so it's really our responsibility to um, to receive this from the past generation and then pass it off to the next generation. And so sometimes when an area, um, sometimes when there's active degradation, uh, a painting again is maybe actively flaking away, it's our, our we're, we're obliged to, to step in and halt that. The preservation of the object, the physical object is one thing. Um, preservation of the artistic message that the artist is trying to communicate to us, that's a whole nother thing. And so this process of cleaning the painting and getting back to um, what's original and then restoring the picture um, is, is more of this kind of abstract concept of preservation where we're trying to preserve that artistic idea. Artists in Connecticut's capital city are always up to amazing things. And just as astonishing as restoring the old is creating the new. And that's exactly what musician Dom McLennan is doing. Dom, 
thanks so much for having us in your studio here. Of course, Ray. Thank you so much for thank you guys for being here. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Tell me about this space. Um, so this is kind of like my creative laboratory, I guess, if you will. Um, my personal workspace that I've extended and opened up to the community. So Brockhampton was the boy band that I have been a part of for like the better half of the last decade of my life. After signing with RCA Records in 2018, Brock Hampton's album Iridescence debuted at number one on the Billboard 200 album chart, and that's when Dom toured the world. Really, really incredible group of individuals. I learned so much about like camaraderie and leadership and building and developing a team and fostering growth and talent and manifesting potential um, with those groups of individuals. And, you know, we, we started, I started with them in 2012, but they started in 2009. And it was just like, oh, this is like really cool. Like you really built this like unit and stuff like that. Originally it started kind of as a collective where everyone had their own solo things going on and we just kind of appear on each other's records and stuff like that. But then 2014 was when Kevin, um, the front man of Brockhampton, made the decision. He was like, okay, I wanna, I wanna really like lock in on this band thing and if anybody wants to commit to this, let's move to Texas. Our, fr our main engineer and one of the other vocalists and lead members of the band is going to school at um, Texas State and they're doing a sound recording technology program. While they're doing that there, we should all move to the same town and we should all like start locking in and going to the studio together, things of that nature, building up the chemistry, all that type of stuff. So it was just a matter of like, okay, am I ready to like commit to this? And then it was just like, let's try it. I keep hearing Brockhampton referred to as a boy band. Uh, and there are things about Brockhampton to me that seem very anti-boy band. One of them you mentioned, that everybody in the group had their own forte, their own thing, and then you guys just kind of forged together. And so, you know, typically when I think of boy bands, I think of like a producer-driven type of, of situation. Where, 100%, yeah. Yeah, and, but you guys were out there doing your own stuff, and it wasn't just, you know, three rappers and a DJ. You had lots of different, people had lots 100%. of different skills. Yeah. T -t Talk about that. Um, I think that that's just, in my opinion, like a sign of the times, mm -hmm. it was like a sign of like what and like what independence can do, and like you know DIY, but not only just DIY, do it yourself, but do it together, and like the power of doing it together, you know. Mm -hmm. So like I feel like that's really like part of the core foundation as to like what made the nucleus of Brock Campton even work in the first place. Try to sacrifice it for the success and turn the birds while externally blessed. It's been a raw dark set. My therapist said that's too much to compress. Put my soul to the test. Identity could be the infinite jest. Along with sound robbing all distress. It's work to stop the descent. It's different when I listen to it and I understand. Commitment and fulfillment. I battle so not the end. I still get codependent and worry about the plan. Adjusting to a space so I'm calling up the commands. Appreciate the pace of my life. So Dom, you've got a lot of layers on on this track so far. What's what's next? So what what I would do next is I feel like I figured the core arrangement of the track out. I figured out like what the hook sounds like, and we've got all of our instruments that are going to be in the record. Now it's going to be a matter of taking some stuff out, making sure that things are placed in the right positions, arranging a verse, if you will, and then being able to set this arrangement up so that it can either be used with or without drums and. You know, maybe somebody ends up sampling it and using it in a completely different record. Maybe it ends up on a commercial, like an advertisement as like a sync. Or maybe I end up writing to it and putting a record out myself with it or with like one of my friends I might write for a singer that I know or something like that. Mm -hmm. Potentially what my big picture goal is, is like doing library music out here with the musicians in the community really like comes into play because all of this stuff can kind of get utilized in so many different formats. There's the commercial world, there's the audio production world, there's the just non-commercial like creative artistic world. And I'm really 
excited about the idea of being able to kind of express my creativity, not just as a creator, but as a curator of like being able to, you know, develop these experiences where I get folks together and we're able to just express ourselves. What you about to do for dinner? That's a good question. I got a cod. You got a cod? Well, let's talk a little bit about your new venture, mm -hmm. Court Vision, yeah. which I love the name of because I'm a basketball player and Court Vision is a great way to describe what you're doing. And it also kind of is this Brockhampton method in a way too, where every, you have all these different skill sets all working together toward the same thing. Was that kind of the idea? Yeah, so I took a lot of the things that I learned being a role player in Brockhampton to be a team leader at Court Vision. Mm -hmm. Court Vision is the creative agency that I've been building out and developing. And um, we have a lot of work that we've done with producing events, producing experiences out here. My dad is really big into basketball and has been like around the Hartford and Connecticut community as like a, a basketball force. He used to train with guys like Daniel Marshall and Ben Baker and Ray Allen. Oh and yeah, yeah. Like all those guys at Gamble. When I was like a little kid, he used to take me to Gamble and I would just like run around the court or like sit on the sidelines yeah. while they were like playing and stuff like that. And then like, I have like memories of like Ray taking me to like go get ice cream from the food court and oh, stuff like that. that. Right? Yeah, he's <laughs> awesome people. Well, Dom, thank you so much. First, for showing us your great music, but telling your story, seeing all the great things that's happening with Court Vision, really eye-opening. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. I really, really appreciate you guys coming out here. Thank you so much, Ray. Like, your your presence is needed out here, and we're, we're very grateful for you as the arts community and creators in this community of you helping tell our stories. Well, Hartford's art scene has so much vibrancy in life with so much to explore, I'm so grateful to get a chance to experience a piece of that. Until next time, I'm Ray Hartman, and this is Where Art Thou? Support provided by the Richard P. Garmini Fund at the Hartford Foundation for Public Giving, the State of Connecticut Office of Film, Television, and Digital Media, and Connecticut Humanities.